and uh, hopefully you will find uh, a lot of value in uh, getting uh, to know the, the center better. So BioXL was uh, established six years ago uh, with uh, funding from the European Union and uh, we are several uh, universities, uh, research centers, uh, HPC centers as well companies uh, that are working together on making scientific software of much higher quality, user-friendly, but also increasing the skills and the expertise of uh, the users of this software and helping the community do research better. So BioXL in a nutshell is, uh, has two main um, uh, areas of work. One is the development of various uh, software applications and tools that are quite popular in the research communities. Uh, but also around these uh, developments, we uh, offer various uh, services uh, regarding training, consultancy, and so on. Also, we work uh, a lot on bridging the gap between academia and industry, helping with the uptake of such uh, technologies at a commercial scale from, for example, uh, pharmaceutical companies are uh, using a lot of our codes in their R&D work. Uh, a brief uh, overview of the core applications in BioXL, you, you're very familiar with Gromox and you will become even better in using it in these uh, two days. Uh, in addition to Gromox and MD, we also develop software for... Uh, uh, do you see my slides? Because I got a message here. Yeah, okay. Uh, software for uh, docking integrative modeling, HADOC. It's very widely used and popular. CP2K for hybrid QMMM calculations for those of, our, uh, of you who are doing enzymatic creations and so on. Uh, also, PMX is a tool that was uh, developed to a large extent in the duration of BioXL and it's uh, becoming uh, more popular, uh, in particularly with uh, drug design studies. Also, I want to point out about our work on uh, development of platforms and workflow solutions, such as the BioXL building blocks, BioBB, which allow you to mix and match various tools and create your own workflows that will dramatically uh, improve improve your productivity and auto automate how you do research on HPC. In addition to these applications, as I mentioned, we, we have a, a, a broad range of ser services, which uh, I'm sure you will find very useful. Uh, you've probably already been to the support forums, in particular the gromax.bioxcel.eu forums, where uh, you find a lot of valuable information. We are uh, running for many years webinar series. Uh, they're really great. Uh, browse through them. They cover a lot of different topics related to biomolecular simulations and modeling, different applications, methods, tools. Uh, there's a wealth of knowledge there. And also, uh, I've listed some uh, links uh, with uh, material that uh, you can uh, uh, use in, in your work increase your competence. We have very extensive training program which is uh, based on a competency uh, framework where we try to deliver the relevant training to fill the gaps in, in to address exactly the missing parts of what uh, researchers uh, are lacking in terms of uh, expertise. Uh, we've been receiving uh, excellent and very good feedback uh, on most of our events. So I, I hope these two days will not disappoint you and we'll get uh, high scores as well. Uh, one big event I want to highlight and point out if you have not uh, learned about it yet is uh, next month in October, we are holding our first uh, large uh, online conference as a it's called Ambo Workshop because the, uh, we get funding from Ambo to organize it. Uh, it's, a, it's a big conference. It's a great lineup of speakers. Check out uh, the, the keynotes. So you will see many familiar uh, names there. Uh, it, uh, it, it's a really great event and I, I highly recommend you consider uh, attending and uh, participating. Registration deadline and abstract submission is uh, coming up soon. You, there is still some time. Uh, 
a quick uh, heads up about uh, something also what uh, BioXL is uh, uh, going to uh, uh, most soon. We are in the process of launching this non-profit organization, BioXL Enterprises, which will uh, broaden the scope and allow uh, collaborations and uh, partnering between uh, many different uh, uh, other uh, organizations uh, from the community. If you're interested, um, we'll be happy to give you more information. Uh, so please contact us. I highly recommend that you subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out approximately once a month, uh, or if there is something very uh, important, a bit more often, but it's very low volume. You will uh, get to know about all the recent developments, learn about new events, webinars coming up. Uh, I think you'll find a lot of value in uh, uh, staying in touch with us and uh, with that i wish you a very successful workshop you're in in great hands uh, you have the the, the best uh, training trainers uh, today and tomorrow i'm sure there will be uh, a lot of uh, knowledge you get and uh, i wish you success in the workshop and also in your future work thank you everyone Hello, good morning. Now Alessandra Villa will make its presentation about MD with Gromax. Good morning. I have some problem in sharing the screen. Could you allow me to share it? Let's see, Alessandra, if it's okay. Because from my side, you have permission. Okay. Now you should see my screen, is correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Rita. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to this workshop. And in this hour, I will try to introduce you to the molecular simulation and in particular molecular simulation using Chromax. My name is Alessandra Villa. I work at for BioXL. This is a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research at PDC at the Royal Institute of Technology, a Stockholm in Sweden. So um, if you want to ask questions, please use uh, the live document that uh, Pedro was mentioning at the beginning in, in, the, in the introduction to the workshop. And maybe now we can cut and paste, can, can, we can put in the chat the link to the live document. So you can just click the document, it's a Google Doc document, and you can just type there your question. And at the end of my presentation, uh, Rita will chair the Q&A section. So then you will read the questions that are there and I will answer. The question that we have no time to address, I will then later type the question answer in the document or some of those more peculiar question we can assess tomorrow that we have a short section for a general Q&A on Gromax where I and Joe Jordan will be present to discuss with you. Uh, okay, so molecular simulation. Now we move to molecular simulation. We have different reasons why we want to do molecular simulation. Here I just took an example for my work here we were interest, interested to understand better the interaction between two molecules. And these are two peculiar molecules. One is an antibody and the other is an antigen. The blue one is an antibody. The yellow one is an antigen. And we were interested to understand better the interaction between these two molecules. And we performed simulation to generate a conformation and ensemble to generate a lot of conformation and if this number is large enough, that was allow, allowed, will, is allowing us to get uh, experiment property, accurate value of a property. So that means that uh, the goal of a molecular simulation in general is to generate 
enough representative conformation of a molecular system in such a way that accurate value of a property can be obtained. There are several methods that you, one can use to perform molecular simulation. Here we will focus on one that is molecular dynamics simulation. What is the main, uh, the main challenge or the challenge in general of molecular simulation in general? So when we perform a, a biomolecular simulation in particular, we aim to reproduce a biophysical process. A biophysical process like folding, for example, binding, aggregation, and usually involve uh, protein, DNA, RNA, nucleic acid, and others, and other small molecules. That means that involve hundreds of thousands of atoms, and those atoms as very integrated interaction between themselves. That those interactions are very difficult to simplify, and that I think is the first challenge that we have. Another challenge that we have when we want to describe those processes is that those processes span uh, over a, a large range of time scale. We have primary events like photosynthesis take taking, that take place in picoseconds. We move to enzymatic and regulatory process that might take milliseconds up to some conformational organization that might exceed seconds. So we need an approach that is able to deal with the very different time scale. And, and the last challenge that we have is that when we perform a simulation, in a, sorry, in a biophysical process, all the molecular change that occur are driven by very small driving force. So it's very important that we describe those interactions with a very fine-tuned potential in a way that properly, we properly describe those interactions. So I think that is the three challenges that we have when we perform biomolecular simulation that we always have to keep in mind when we start the project or when we want to use molecular simulation. Now I will go more in specific on molecular dynamics simulation. So the idea between, behind molecular dynamics simulation is to generate conformation applying the Newton law of motion, or the nature law of motion on the atom. So we start, usually we have always a conformation, that means a, a position of the atom, and we have also the position of that in a one point in time. We apply the Newton equation of motion and we get a new conformation at an, another point in time. And this point in time will be a step forward in time and delta t. And uh, so in this way, we generate a set of conformation at different time point. So we have in molecular dynamic simulation information of the position. On, the, uh, on each step, we have information on the position of the atom, on the velocity of the atom, and the time point, where we are. What exactly say the Newton equation of motion? The Newton equation of motion is a relation between the acceleration of one atom acting on the atom and the force acting on that atom and the mass on the mass atoms. This is a second order differential equation that cannot be solved analytically. So uh, for this reason, we all resolve in a small step, in a time step. The mass is really known. Then we know the mass of all the atoms, if we're speaking about uh, atomistic model. And the force is coming from the potential. The potential is a collection of functions that describe all the interaction between all the particles in your system. So the first derivative respect the position of the particle. The negative value of this first derivative is equal to the force acting on the particle. So during the simulation, we calculate the force acting on the particle, we know the mass, and we get acceleration. From the acceleration, we know the velocity of the particle, and then we can we can move and on the time. You will see that those steps that we usually use in the simulation are very, very tiny step compared to a real human step. And uh, usually in the simulation, we see also different movement in the of the molecule. So that means a different type of the arrangement of the atom, vibration of the bond, oscillation of the angle, and rotation of 
the torsion, torsion angle. How, what happens when you do a simulation? That I mean, when you use, you move and you go to use a simulation software. So in this case, we are speaking about Gromax as a simulation software. And so we, I just go through to the input file of Gromax. So you will need a file where you provide information of the position of all the atom, because we say that we need the, start, the position of the atom for each step. So we need the, start, the, the starting position of all the atoms. You will have another file that provide the information, that is the topology file, that provide information on all the potential, the interaction between the atoms so of the potential, both the parameter used inside those potential and also the analytical form. And then we have a simulation parameter file where we tell somehow what we want to do, how long we want to simulate, in which condition, and other specific things. These are three ingredients that we always need when we run a simulation using Gromax. When, once we are run, we let run the simulation, we will see that we will get four, three mainly, three output file. So we will get a trajectory file that has a, might have different format, but contains information, the position, in some sense, in some case, can also contain information on the position, the velocity and the force acting on the atom on each step that you ask to save. An energy file that contains the information, the energetic information also related to the step that you ask to save, and a, a log file that is a, a ASCII file where you see you can read those information energy setting. Uh, those files, you can, while you run the simulation, you can always have a look at those files, analyze them, process them. You don't, we don't need that the simulation is finished to have a look at those files. But then in the future, we will see more in detail which information will go in each file. And in the tutorial, we will see how we generate those files. So really how we will do the simulation, but just for you to have a feeling which information we need to begin and which information we get as output. Of course, those, those data that are somehow the raw data of the simulation, then you have to post-process and analyze them to get to the property that you are interested in. So speaking about pro property, when we run simulation, we always, I will say the main goal is to generate enough conformation such a way that we can calculate the property in accurate way. And usually when we look property, we also want to compare to experimental property. So if we think an experiment, uh, usually experiment act on a macroscopic sample. Experiment measure an average property of a large number of molecules. Usually we speak about mole, so it's something 10 to the power 23 molecules. So a large number of molecules, and usually it's also average of the time that the measurement will take. So this is how we get the property experimentally. The simulation enable us to predict the property of the system generating the several conformation, but of a single system, not multiple system. And if our conformation ensemble is ergodic, we can extract accurate, an accurate value of the property that we want. What means ergodic means that the average over time is equal to the ensemble average. That means that we have sample and we have enough conformation to extract the property. And that we have always to account when we perform simulation, our sampling is long enough. Now I have a small pool because I think I provide a lot of different information just to catch up a little the tension. It's just a small pool on uh, Gromax. So I will ask you if you could just uh, fill in it, click what you think. So the question is, uh, which of the following Gromax feature do you consider most important? 
I will just give uh, some minutes. So everybody have the time to, and I, as answer, we have a Grom that is fast, flexible, and free. Fast uh, means that uh, we can perform simulation. We have, a, uh, we can, the, that the software can scale in a good way, that we will hear more about this uh, tomorrow by Mark Abra. Flexible that, for example, you can use different force fields, you can use different potential, you can you have flexibility and decide what you want to do. And free, that is open source. I see that uh, we got 19% uh, of the people answer, so we are we I end up the pool. Agile share just for curiosity. The, results. I think you see the results now. So we see that most of the people think, 47% of the people thinks that important, the flexibility. Now that is very nice. And we have the same amount of people that think that it's free, almost we are very close between fast and free. That is something important that we can, because as a developer of Gromax, frequently people ask themselves in which direction we want to to go and that might give us some hint. Okay, thank you. I, I stop sharing now. Do you? Yeah. Okay, now we go on. And so I told you the basis idea of molecular dynamic simulation. So this simulation is integrated as a Newton equation and generate conformation in time. Now, but uh, these, the results that we get are affected, that governs of different aspects. There are aspects concern how we describe the system. So the degree of freedom, the interaction potential. There are uh, other aspects like integration time step, boundary condition, how we deal with that which time step we use, treatment of the temperature of the pressure, because usually we are, we want to aim on the physical approaches. So that means that we want to aim a specific thermodynamic ensemble, and maybe it's a canonical ensemble or it's an, an MPT ensemble. So we have to control somehow both the temperature and the pressure to be in a close condition with the experiment. Then I will say something about the starting configuration, of course, the play also role, you have to start with a reasonable correct starting configuration and the role of the environment. That is also a way in which we come closer to the experiment. So we have to account for similar environment, how the environment of the molecule in the experiment that could be in vivo or maybe in the future in vitro. Sorry, in vitro or maybe also in vivo. So the first aspect is the degree of freedom. We have different way in which we can describe our molecular system. So usually we describe a system with particles. If the most use in, in biophysics, uh, one of the most uh, used uh, approaches is an atomistic description. So where we describe one atom with one particle. But we have also other approach. We are more close brain approach where we decide to describe a group of atoms with one particle. Or sometimes we need a more detailed description. So we need not only to describe the position of the atom, but we want also information about the electron so that we have to go to description more based on quantum chemistry. So as you see, from going from a, a description based from quantum chemistry up to the cost grain, we reduce the degree of, free, of freedom of the system. On the other end, also, when we want to describe the system in a very accurate way, we so using quantum, also quantum description, we nowadays can achieve picoseconds and usually the system should be, it's reasonably small. Uh, Atomistic simulation, now we are, we are in the range of uh, 
depends on the dimension of the system of uh, uh, microseconds, I will say. And the system uh, vary between nanometer, hundreds of nanometer or larger. And then if you want to really go up and describe, you need to, to answer to your question, to describe a very large system, then uh, you have to move to a cold screen model. Cold screen models are very different. There are some cold screen models, we say force field based, so like uh, the Martini force field. There are also post grain model ad hoc built to, to describe the system in that specific condition for answering a specific question. So we have very different type of post grain models. We have a, a group of post grain models that uh, we say that are closely linked to the atomistic description. That means that we, we have an atomistic description of our system, so it's particle is one atom and then we have a relation between the position of the atoms and the position of the bit in the cold grain description. That will allow us to move from atomistic to cold grain. We reduce of course the degree of freedom but allowed us on one point after running the cold grain simulation to go back, we say back map, the position of the atomistic atoms. This, this relation between the cold grain and atomistic allowed us, allowed us to build what are the multi-scale approach. So there are different types of uh, multi-scale approach, but one of those could be that you run the simulation at cold grain level and uh, on some point uh, you go back to have an atomistic description because you need some more detailed information on that specific information. And then you can move on to the cold grain, and then when you have a specific information, you can go back to the atomistic. That is one of the ways in which it's used. There are other approach that continually switch between atomistic and cold grain. That is could also be another approach. There are different ways in which you can deal with the cold grain, a multi-scale approach. Okay, but I think the most important question is to choose the appropriate molecular model when you want to simulate. So you have to choose two things, which degree of freedom you want to describe. So you, want, you need atomistic information or you don't need. This is the first thing that you have to think about. The second thing is that, uh, which are the most appropriate energy function to describe the interaction between the particle of your system. So these are the two ingredients that you have to choose. You have, there are, we have, there are literature multiple model available between which you can choose. Other things that I think you have to account when you make this choice is that the model should encompass the property of interest. So you have to be sure that the model that you are choosing can describe the property that you are interested. So the simulation time that you can achieve with that model, we saw that uh, depends on how much the field freedom you use, you can simulate different time or different simulation of different dimension and of different time scale. So you have to be sure that uh, with that model, you can uh, reach simulation time that are larger than the time of the approaches that you are interested to study. And also that the size that the system, the size that you can simulate is larger is larger than the size of the system that you are interested in. So these are the three elements that you have to account when you choose which model you want to use. How are those models? So I think there are very nice lecture from the Nobel lecture in chemistry in 2013. And that are given by Marco, Martin Karklus, Michael Levy, and uh, Ariel Varshall. But the one that uh, I took this sentence from the one from Michael Levy, he will say a simplified representation of a molecular system should be as simple as possible. And I think that is very nice. This is applied also to any model. If you can think about the reason, why is the reason? I think the best way to understand the reason is to think about uh, uh, other type of model, like uh, the weather forecast model. If you have a very accurate model, 
that can predict your, your weather forecast. Very good, but it's very slow. So then it means that you will get the weather forecast of today, tomorrow. That means that it's not useful. We can just throw it away. It's not necessary. We don't use that information. So we, with a, mo a model, should be stay a model and provide us an answer in a reasonable time. So it's important that modeling in here that we use are so as simple as possible, but also accurate as possible. Usually what we describe in those models, if we think about on the atomistic model, we can simply, if we try to simplify the movement of a molecule. So this is just a, a molecule, SIHA, uh, and amino acid is. And uh, you can see that we can think about that bond oscillate. We can simplify that the angle also oscillates somehow, the bond vibrate, the angle oscillate, and we have rotation along the bond. So this is, and then we, we imagine also that one molecule cannot penetrate in another one. And if something is a slightly positive charge, we'll be attracted with something negative. So all this is a simplification of all our system, but we try to think this way in a simplified way to build our molecular, our, our potential. And if we go to see a standard expression of the potential, you will, you will see that all the functions that we are taking are coming from classical mechanics. This type of approach is called molecular mechanics force field. And usually in this uh, potential function, we have contribution from the bonded interaction and contribution from the non-bonded interaction. Uh, the bonded interaction are divided in bond, angles, torsion, and in the non-bonded interaction, we found uh, uh, Lena Jones interaction and uh, Van der Waals interaction and uh, electrostatic interaction. We have to pay this is just an example. So each force field has its own set of analytical function and its own set of parameters that we have always to keep in mind. And they, these two are always going together. You cannot use an analytical function of one force field and a set of parameters of another force field. That is not possible. So those, uh, if we think about the atomistic force field again, those usually are based on atom types. Those atom types usually are related to the functional group where the atom is in. So they are more many than it, the number of elements that we have. So we will have different type of oxygen, different atom type for oxygen. We will have also different atom type for carbon, for example. The parameter, like I was saying before, intimately codependent from the functional form and each other. So we cannot use the parameter of one force field in another, with another functional form. And we can never mix force field parameters. We cannot take, oh, we miss a parameter, we take this from another force field. No, that is not possible. Because as we say before, our large challenge is to have uh, to tune all this interaction. If you take a parameter from another force field that it will is built to account for all, it depends from all the other parameters that describe all the other atoms there. So that will be not working. And so if you need to add the new parameters, you can do, and but you have to follow the parameter strategy of the force field. If we speak about atomistic force field for biomolecule simulation, now we have, uh, I would say four main families, Ander, Charm, Gromox, the OPLS, and then as a close grain force field, we have Martini force field. There are also available a lot of online server, offline tools that can help you to build topology and uh, to create uh, for more general, no standard molecule. Then we go where the, those force field come from, force field parameters, sorry. So this is a little historical. So the force field parameter, each force field has its own strategy and the, force, the parameter that is built in here, 
it's a long, very long process. So usually they, they might come from experimental ob initial study, for example, of small compounds. Uh, an example is crystal data can be used for bond lengths, angles. Uh, yeah, or Rama spectroscopy can be used for four constant, for example, for bond angles. Charge might come from uh, quantum chemistry calculation. There are also other approach that do not just take the value from a initial experimental study, but they just have a trial and procedure. So they refine the parameter to be able to reproduce some thermodynamic or kinetic property. Usually mm, parameters are built for on a small compound, and we always leave, we always assume that parameter developed for a small compound can be transferred to a large molecule having the same functional chemical functional group. When you choose a force field, one thing that is very important is to check how much is used this force field. More a force field is used for your specific system, more people has found and discovered if there are problems. And then you, you may be more trustable. So it's always good to look in literature how many people use that force field to study that specific system. So now we have looked at where parameter come from. We have seen that we have different uh, function, a type of function, uh, function uh, inside the, the potential. So we have a bonded. Uh, a uh, function that is called bond interaction, and we have function that is called no bonded interaction. Now I will go a little more in detail. I will point your attention a little more on the non bonded interaction. There is okay. Non bonded interaction are usually calculated over every pair of atom of the system if those atoms are not bond between each other with one, two, three bond. I would say. So if you imagine if we want to calculate all those interactions, it means if we have n atom in our system, the number of interactions that we have to calculate is roughly n square. And that is more than 90% of the computational time of our simulation. So we have to find a way to deal and to reduce this number of interactions that has to be calculated. So if you look at, you think about to the Leonard Jones potential, for example, it decay with one over r power six. And if you think on the Coulomb potential, it is also on one over r. So it decay, decay Coulomb potential is lower than the Leonard Jones, but still they all decay to zero along a long distance. So maybe we can assume that the contributions of, of the interaction between two atoms that are very far away between each other is very small. So historically, the beginning was thought, uh, okay, we can just uh, truncate the potential. So we calculate in a no bonded interaction only for the atoms that are close to each other. So that are within a cutoff. The cutoff was chosen usually in the range, depends on the force field of uh, one, 1 1.2 nanometer. And there we assume so because those uh, interaction we calculate those in, my, in a split way. But truncate so hard the potential, it might cause problems. Of course, one of the problems is that we completely ignore the long range contribution, and that might have some contribution that we want to account for it. And the second thing is that the potential the force becomes discontinuous at the cutoff point. So we with there were uh, was other solution were introduced. So now well, most of the force field uh, use particle mesh well to describe, for example, the long range interaction. We have PME for both for uh, Leonard Jones and for electrostatic. Other force field use more an approach like a reaction field, but they try to account for this long range effect and to correct for it. So now I want to tell you where those information go in the input file that I told you before. We just go back to Gromax. So all the information about the molecular model, 
are in the topology file and in other files that are included in the topology file. So there we have the information on the connectivity of the bond, which atoms is bond with which angles, which non-bonded interaction we have to use, and there is a link to the corresponding to the corresponding parameter file. We also, there is a tool that can help inside the preprocessing tool that can help to build this topology file that is GMX, PD, PDP to GMX. But we will see in the tutorial. Then we have another information, the information on the treatment on the long range interaction. Those information are in MDP file, not in the topology file. So if we use PME, which cutoff we use, those are all going in the parameter file. While the information, the point charge and the van der Waals parameter, these are again inside the topology file or inside the file that are called include inside the topology file. Okay, now we have seen the degree of freedom interaction potential, and now we see another aspect that can govern your simulation, is the integration time step. So actually the time step that we need determine how much we can simulate. If we have a large time step, we might achieve a longer time. The smaller the time step, the more expensive is the calculation. That is also logic, it's the other way around. But we cannot choose the time step that we want. There is a strict relation between the time step and the potential that we are using. And the degree of freedom that we are describing. So in general, we want the appropriate time step because if we, we have a, a too small time step, then it will never happen something, it will take age. If we have a too large time step, we have, in, we, we have instability. So we want the appropriate time step. And if you can see from the table below, there is a strict relation between the time step and the degree of freedom that we want, we describe. For a rigid model, we can use time step on the order of five femtoseconds, for example, but if we want to explicitly describe all the flexible bond, we might need to time step on one femtoseconds. And there is, if we have a steep, a steep potential, we need to use a small time step. If we have a shallow potential, we might use a larger time step. And that is also one of the reasons why if you have never, if you use a cost grain model, usually they associate with very, with larger time step than atomistic model. They are combined with larger time step than atomistic model. So there is strict relation between the degree of freedom and the shape of the potential in the choice of the time step. We have also some other things that help us to use a larger time step than what uh, one might be necessary. So for example, is a constraint algorithm. So light atom also dominate the time, the vibration of light atom might dominate the value of the time step that you have. So one approach is to remove the vibration of the bond using constraints algorithm. In Gromax, we have implemented the three main uh, constraint algorithm, links, P links, and shake. Or the other option is to remove the fast motion of the angle, in, the rotation of the angles involving hydrogen. For example, in the methyl group or in the mine groups. So then, uh, there we can use, a, we can build a virtual site. So we can construct a virtual size based on the position of the atoms so that you can see the, virt here you can see the virtual size uh, in gold. The force are calculated on the atom and then are redistributed on the virtual size and then the integration go on on the virtual size and then we go back. So this is another approach to increase and then in this way we can go to five femtoseconds. Where are those information go when you have to run the simulation? Time step and constraint information are going in the simulation parameter file while 
topology in the topology file we will give information on the virtual site site so now i have a question for you that is also that is uh, so if the pool can pull up yeah thank you so which of the following setting depends from the force field and here you can have you it's not necessary one the answer but can be we can have multiple answer So the possible answer are the ball constraint, treatment on long range interaction and time step. I just wait that everybody has the time to answer to the question. Okay, it seems that we have reached a plateau in the answer. So I end the pool and I share the results with you. So that is, we can, so most of you think that bone constraint and treatment of a range interaction are closely related to the choice of the force field. And I'll think that also the time step. Actually, all these three depends are strictly depend on the force field that you choose. So uh, some force fields are parameterized exactly using that time step and that bond and these uh, constraints are, for example, only on the hydrogen, then you have to use them with that time step and with the bond, the hydrogen bond constraints. You have no choice to. So you have always to check the force field and the long range interaction is the same. So in the parametration procedure people usually use a setting for the long range interaction so that is the setting that you have to use when you run the simulation you cannot change that because it is intrinsically part of the force field so we, i will say all these three depends on the force field so before setting the parameter file you have to go back to check which are the setting on in the parameterization to know which time step you can use and which cost training you can use and which treatment of the long range interaction. Thank you for participating. I stop sharing. Okay. Now we go on to see another aspect. So when we run a simulation, we usually run in a boundary condition. We're using boundary conditions since we don't want to have wall around our box that will be affect our results. If we are just want to simulate a molecule in solution, different if you want to simulate a molecule, the interaction between a molecule and a surface, that is different. But assuming that you want to, have, you have a global protein and you want to simulate it in solution, then we need to have boundary condition. That means that the red one is your real box. And all, all around your box, we have a lot of images, exactly 26 images on the top, on the bottom, and all around. And that means also if that a particle here move out from the box, it will come back on this side. For this reason, it's very important to define correctly the dimension of your box to avoid that one atom see himself. So the dimension of the box should be larger than twice the cutoff, at least. We have in Gromax implemented different uh, shape of the box. So this, the historically the oldest one is the cubic rectangular one. Then there is an hexagonal one that is suggested for a membrane simulation, where you see that compared to the volume of the cube, cube is reduced. Then we have a truncated uh, octahedron that also has a 77% of a cube volume. 
And then orthorhombin the decahedron, that is the most spherical one, so it's only 71% of the cubic. Why we want to reduce as much as the volume is uh, because we know that uh, the calculation, the long range, in uh, the non bonded interaction, and the long range is time consuming. So if uh, we have uh, a global protein, like described, for example, here, the, these, uh, these, the water on this edge will not have a lot of contribution. So it will be good to describe it more in a phrasical way, so we have less molecules to describe. That is the reason why we move. But one has always, when you choose the box, to be careful of the shape of the system that you want to simulate. Then we go to the treatment to this information, sorry, in Gromax, are set, uh, the box information are in the structural file and you can use uh, these tools to generate the box, uh, your box. And uh, in the simulation parameter file, you will say if you want to run with periodic boundary condition or not. Then we go on and then we have the treatment of temperature and pressure. So we were, as I was say before, when we are interested in biophysical process, we are interested also those projects occur in a specific environment. It can be in a canonical ensemble or it can be an MPT ensemble. A canonical ensemble is an ensemble where the number of particles, the volume and the temperature is constant, while uh, MPT ensemble is an example where the a thermodynamic example where the number of particles, the pressure and the temperature are constant. That means that we need some control some way during the simulation to control our temperature and our pressure to guarantee the thermodynamic example that we want to describe. So how we calculate temperature in molecular dynamic simulation? So there is a strict relation between the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is given by the velocity acting on the atoms and by the mass, sum of all the particles, shall we say, in the system. And this is equal to the number of degree of freedom of the system, the Boltzmann constant temperature divided by two. In this number of degree of freedom, to calculate this number of degree of freedom, we have to account that we are uh, we are simulate a molecule in solution, so n common will be three. So we will be the molecule will be in vacuum. Probably this will be six. And then we have to account for the total number of particles, and for we have to remove also the constraint the acting on the system. So as you can see with this relation, uh, so if there is a strict relation between the kinetic energy that we can calculate in an independent way and the temperature. So a one way to control the temperature is to control the velocity of the particle too. If you tune the velocity of the particle, you will also change the value of the temperature. How, so how we control the temperature in the simulation, we usually use a thermostat. The role of the thermostat is not to, to have the, temp, the desired temperature, but is to have the correct average temperature. So a good thermostat should provide you a correct average temperature, but also a correct fluctuation of the temperature. We have in the community, there are several thermostats, and here I just list the most used in the, the molecular simulation. The oldest one, and the historical was used before, was the balance and weak coupling. That was, it's very efficient to relax the system to the target temperature, but it suppresses the fluctuation of the kinetic energy, so it doesn't reproduce a correct ensemble, thermodynamic ensemble. So recently in 2007, oh sorry, this is a while ago, 10 years ago, in 2007, uh, there was a new thermostat, the velocity rescaling temperature, and that is based on the same idea of the Berenson thermostat, but they added an additional uh, stochastic term that will allow to ensure that we have a correct temperature fluctuation. 
So it's the one that I will suggest now. And it also is also efficient in relaxing the system to the target temperature. Another uh, thermostat that is available that is more old, so it's from the 80, it's also over a uh, thermostat. And here the philosophy is different, it's a thermal reservoir and a friction term are added to the equation of motion. And uh, in that is a, a, a good thermostat, but it is not so good in relaxing the system to the target temperature it will do it slightly slower or you can get strange fluctuations. Now we go to the pressure. How we calculate the pressure in, in simulation. So the pressure usually is related to the volume of the system. As you can see in this expression, again, we have a, the degree of freedom. This is the pressure, degree of freedom, Boltzmann constant, the temperature over and then down, we have divide by the volume. And minus another term, and it is the virial. And uh, the virial uh, is described the contribution to the, the force acting on the particle between the particle. And uh, this is calculate. Since we have the force in MD, we can uh, calculate easy the virial. And you can see that here also we have the volume. We divide for the volume. So, this give us an idea that one way to control the pressure is to scale the position of the molecule. So in this case, you scale also the volume and then you can control the pressure. And what we use to control the pressure, usually we use what is called barostat. The barostat uh, can uh, uh, couple the pressure in an isotropic way, in the same isotropic or is an isotropic way, different, not all the thermostat work in all these three conditions. And you, in Brahmas, you can also have, uh, you can also couple the surface tension. Also in this case, the main aim is to reproduce the average pressure and the fluctuation of the pressure. If of pressure, like we will see in the tutorial, are very large, usually. Uh, historically, one of the oldest one, two oldest one, are Car uh, Car uh, Parinello Raman Barostat and Berenson Barostat. Uh, Car Parinello Rama is working similar to Nose Uber temperature coupling, so it's acting on, uh, on the Hamiltonian. So as two terms including the Hamiltonian, is might, is we are very far away to the reference pressure, it might cause uh, some strange fluctuation and crash, and consequence crash in the system. But if the system is close to the desired pressure, we, it's a very good power start. The, Berenson also is scaling coordinate and the box every step, every desired step, the box vector as a design step is, uh, is reproducing the pressure, but also here we have some, we don't reproduce the fluctuation of the pressure. So the solution on this is again, something that came out very recently, stochastic salary scaling that add also here, we add a stochastic stem to the Berenson algorithm. And in this way, we can reproduce both the pressure and the fluctuation of the pressure. So now we have seen all the information about the pre temperature and the pressure are going inside the MDP parameter file. So now we are missing the starting configuration. So, of course, to start this, any simulation, you need to have something, an initial coordinate. They can come from experimental structure, X-ray crystallography, NMR, IOM. They can build self-built, usually a modeling, modeling, docking. And also for the solvent, we need a pre-built solvent box. So this is also to be built. When we take any initial co coordinate, we have to pay attention on some things. We have always to account that maybe not uh, all the atoms are visible in an experimental structure, or maybe because they are too flexible, maybe because they are too light. 
there are different reasons. So we have to check if our experiment, the structure that we took, contains all the information that we need. Also, we have to pay attention on the position of the hydrogen. Not all the technique can provide us accurate info, raw data on the position of the hydrogen. Sometimes, in the, for example, in the experimental data also, the position of the hydrogen are going through the refinement and they might be built based on models. So when we see those, those hydrogen, we have always to think about if that might be there occurs some pK shift. So then that atom might not be protonate, might be unprotonated in that condition, or it might be another autonomic state that what we, the model, the refinement of the mental structure we are showing, that also has to be account. In particular, automatic states are very difficult to detect experimentally. Also, one can think about where are those, the water molecules, sometimes you are really bound, the, also the ion for the ion, are those water molecules really bound or, or they are just there due to the experimental procedure. So we have to account for them there or not. And also, this is also valid for all other small molecules that might be in the structure. So we have always, this just to say that we have always to carefully look to our starting structure to see if we have all the ingredients and if may, maybe some strange effect that we see are not due because the structures start from a special condition. And uh, we usually also need to have some velocity. So usually we, we also, in the start, uh, when we start the simulation, we ask to generate initial velocity base on uh, the temperature, because we want to simulate a specific temperature, so we gen ask to generate uh, the velocity that reproduces that temperature as a starting point. So now we having all those ingredients in the growth file, that this is where all the post information of the particle position are going, and if we ask to generate the velocity, we are asking the MDP file. If we don't generate velocity, it means that our system stands at the temperature at zero. For the protonation at optimum states, or for example, also the end termini, those information are also keep in the topology file. And the partially the and the PDB to JMX tools can help us to add some standard protonation states, shall we say. We might discuss more of this on in the tutorial section. And then we want also to have the molecule in the correct solvent, in the correct ion environment, if it's a membrane protein in the correct lead membrane with appropriate membrane composition. So when we run a simulation, we try to simplify the system but to put all the ingredients that we need to describe the process that we are interested in. That is also. Now I have a quick pool because my time is almost over. A final pool, if you can pick it up, that I will ask you. Which of the following choice do you believe is the most important in a molecular dynamic simulation? Okay, I saw that most of the people active are answering to the question. So I end the pool and I share the results with you. So it means that most of you think that the force field and uh, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that is also what I think because the choice of, for, of the force field is very critical, but probably also if we have a well, Define force field for that problem, then maybe we want to have to be able to simulate long enough to reproduce the property. So I think it's a very nice challenge. 
And also we want to have a good barostat and thermostat. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that is, I found interesting and I thank you for the participation. Yeah, thank you very much. And so I stopped sharing and just one, oh, sorry, I'm sharing, then I, the results, so you can see what was the results of the other people and I stop sharing here. Yeah, okay, so I just go to, the last things that I want to tell you, when you run the simulation, we see all the factors that influence you get a structure, a trajectory file. And what is very important is trajectory file that now you visualize it. I always suggest to look, before you do any analysis, always look the structure. And here I just give you some tips of, of software that you can use to visualize your structure, because maybe you understand how the system behaves, you might get more idea how better you can analyze it. Okay, I thank you, all of you, for your attention. And uh, for the future, if you have any question, please go to the, as Rossan was say before, to the Gromax forum. And I don't know how much is our time. Rita will let me know if we have time for question or if we will just go to the break. Hi, everyone. We have only one question that was already answered by Joe, but I will share. Okay, if it was already answered, that is fine, that uh, the person can, can read the answer. And uh, so maybe we can invite everybody that if they have more questions, just to write it. Maybe you have a question now, and we will discuss that tomorrow. In the, we have a special section for those problems. I think that might be the easy way, So because I think it's important Every that... Sorry, Alessandra, everyone can see my my sh shared document here? No, uh, no, I have to stop sharing. Now, now we can see it. Yes, okay. Peter. So I suggest that we take a break because people might be a little uh, uh, tired. And we address the question tomorrow together with Joe. And, okay, yeah. So I, as, I ask everybody to open the Jupyter notebook that we have to pr provide. You can uh, open, uh, if you have done your local installation, you can open locally with your browser, typing uh, Jupyter notebook and then selecting the tutorial file and uh, in alternative you can use the link that I provide for my binder of the BioExcel by binder. There in my, you might have some time you need there will be sometimes necessary to load it. All these resources will be always saveable so you can assess them also in a, after uh, the workshop and the Gromax page is also active. At the beginning of the tutorial, we have this shell. So to run the shell, you have to go in the shell. For example, the easy way is just click run. And uh, so in my case, because I was just doing some tests, they say that the notebook has been modified. But in your case, you should have that the notebook is not modified. If you're running on my binder, you will have no control. Uh, the reason why we have put this control at the beginning is that because this uh, Jupyter notebook, everybody can type what you want, what wants. So you can by mistake change something and you don't realize. So this warning tells you if you have done already something and you have changed some cell. If that happens, it's not a big problem. You just re-download from the source, the tutorial, and you just start it again. So this is a tutorial to let you understand how to set a molecular dynamic simulation of a small protein. In particular, we use factor 108, that is an anticoagulant, that is very small protein composed by two chain. So we need uh, to go in a, a, a file. In, in, uh, we have to run this shell to be in the correct directory. 
that it will move you in a directory. You will see a directory different from what I see because it depends where you are. This is my setting, my computer. Uh, so we need to run a simulation. We need a starting structure. So the first things that we want is to have a starting structure. And we take the structure function for this tutorial from the PDB databank. Here we can, this is, uh, here we can visualize it with GNL view, but I also, we also provide, and then we can see here the structure. We can see that the structure has two different uh, chain, one in red and one in blue. And you can see that in this structure, there are also somehow other molecules that are not really a, uh, a protein, okay? And those molecules are there probably because it was necessary for the crystallization procedure, and we might not be interested in those proteins. So we will see, we will remove those proteins to run our tutorial. Here is a scene. I put also an alternative. Maybe you are familiar with VMB. You have already VMB installed in your system you want to run to visualize with VMD. It's just enough that you go in this cell and you remove this, the hash in front and then you can run this command. It's just an alternative viewer. So in all the tutorial, you will see that I, we will propose always an alternative way to run the tutorial using, for example, and this is true only locally, VMD and XM Grace for plotting. For the rest, we use mainly Python tools in the tutorial because this we allowed, allowed us also to use my binder. Okay, but we go back to our protein. Now we want to remove in this shell, what we do, we remove all the protein, all the atoms that are not uh, belong to the protein. So, so here is just, uh, and so now we have a new PDB file where we have only information on the protein. Shall we check if it's true? And uh, if we go here, indeed, we don't see all the other molecule, water or ligand, whatever that we had before. Uh, but other information, usually, if you take a protein from the PDB data bank, if uh, they know that there's some loops are missing in the PDB data, in the PDB file, you will find the word missing. There will be this information. So it's important to know if we, for example, this structure is not complete. So we run it and we see nothing as output. So it means that there were no missing atom. So just one comment. You can use this tutorial if you have installed locally also to with another protein. It's just enough that you change the name to the name of your protein, for example. So that is pretty flexible, but that you can do only when you run locally on, on your machine. Okay, now we have the structure of our protein clean. So we have the position of all the atoms of our protein. Now we want to generate a topology file because we know that we need a topology file also, information on the force field, how we interact, define the interaction between all those molecules. To do that, we use a command that is called GMX, uh, PDB to GMX. Here we give an output to the P PDB file. This, uh, tools will provide us a growth file, another coordinate format of the coordinate file, and then it will provide also a topology file as output. Here we also give some information. We want to run our simulation. We already decided that we want to use a specific water model, and in this case we have a tip 3 p water model, and then we say that we want to use a charm force field. Also in the choice of the water model, you have to pay attention that your water model, also your ion model are compatible with the first field that you use to describe. And this in general, the solvent model is compatible to the first field that you use to describe the protein in this case, or the macromolecule. So now we run these tools. You will see that uh, we get a lot of information in this, uh, in this tutorial, with this environmental setting we are using, 
the Gromax version implemented in Bioconda, so you can see that it's modified, but if you don't want and you have Gromax installed, you can also make that is running directly with Gromax, the Gromax version that you have installed there. Okay, so you see that uh, this provides us a lot of information. It tells us that it's reading a lot of default files. You see, these are all under my Miniconda because we are using a Conda environment, Miniconda environment. So all the information of the, of the force field file. Then it tells us uh, that it found two chain, how many rest in each chain, how many atoms. And then it go on to process, to read all the force field file to process. It provides also information how we decide to protonate the histidine. Histidine can have different protonation states, Groma use hydrogen bond criteria to protonate this thing. So if you don't specify something, it just uses criteria. It tell you how, which tautomer is used for which thing. Then it told you also which uh, sulfur bridge it recognized and it has uh, created as a sulfur bridge. And then which termini is, uh, is adding. And then it gives also another important information. It will tell us uh, also the charge of the system. Here we have two change. So this is the first change is plus one. Here it starts to process chain two and it's going on. It's provide the same information and will tell us also the charge of the chain two. So we have one chain that has charge plus one and the other minus three. So the total charge of the protein is minus two. Indeed, here, total charge of system minus two is this information that is important to keep. Okay, we don't have any note, any warning. So we can trust that the first field, the topology file is built in an appropriate way. If you have note, you can get through, but it's more important to go back to the note to check if this is what really you want to have. It is valid for any Gromax tool, any Gromax engine. And if you get a warning, then it will not provide output. You have to go through to understand what are the warning. And uh, we have already selected the first field, but in Gromax, you can select different type of first field that are already implemented in, this, in the Gromax. So you can just choose one of those or you can have a directory with your own force field. You can have uh, a link to that directory or you can have that directory in your working directory. There are other options for PDBJMX that you can, for example, you can ask to ignore the hydrogen of, uh, of the PDB structure because you want that is a new, they are new generating. You can also decide to decide which type of termini you want. You can also decide to ask, give the protonation states of uh, the glutamate, aspergine, lysine, arginine, histidine, and, uh, and choose which sulfur bridge are, which cystidine are involved in sulfur bridge using this option. And you have also other small option that they can allow you to control only the protonation states of the glutamate, for example, or this of, uh, of another residue. So then you can in some way decide if you want which protonation state or which residue. If nothing is given, you give a standard, the protonation according to a, a hypothetical pH 7. So now we go to see, we have run the probe, which file we have. So you can see that he has generated a growth file. So that is a coordinate file. He has generated also topology file and also generate two other topology type of file. And those two files we will see soon are called, are included in this topology.top. And then he has also created other two files that are position restraint file. That is what all the output, one, two, three, four, five, six are the output from pdb 2 genix Okay, now we go to see how it looks like this topology file. Okay, so this is the topology file. This is, uh, it, it, first of all, it's including the directory of uh, the force field. And the, when it's written like this, it means that it's looking for the directory in the standard position, where you assume that where he has a link to a library, where the library are. So this is uh, the directory where the charm force field is implemented. 
Then they also include the information, so include all the first field information, and include also the specific information of the connectivity of these of the two change that are forming our molecule. If we add one molecule, probably we will not have an include file, but we will add the description of the molecule directly here inside the topo, top top. Then include the molecule, the water molecule topology. Then uh, include information of position and strengths of water. And then as we can see here, include information, parameter information for the ions. And then we have the last uh, directive. This is directive is just the name of our system. And then the last directive is a very important directive is molecules. It tells exactly which is the order of the molecules that you will find in this, in the coordinate file. So first we will find protein chain A, and then we will for ion protein chain L. Because at the moment we have no water and no ion in our molecule. So then we can see just briefly here we have two files, but we can see just only one briefly how it looks like. So here at the beginning of, uh, if we go on the mole of the top of this topology ITP file, we see that we define the molecular chain R, that is actually this one. So it's defined in this file. So here we find, in this file, we find all the information of protein chain R. So, and we will see, if we go further in this file, we know we find the name of the, how is the system has decided to call this molecule. And then we see that we have a description of the atoms. So we will add it, we have a directive after molecules, we have a directly, uh, molecules type, sorry, we have a directive called atoms. And then you can see that in this directive, we describe all the atom with the atom type and the charge, and the mass. Here is a table that help you to understand all these, uh, what correspond each of these uh, number. Oh. Then after the directive atoms, we have the directive uh, describe all the type of interaction. I just show one, for example, we have a directly show bond. And in the bond directory, we have information of two atoms and those two atoms have a bond and this bond is described by the function number one, that is a specific type of function that is compatible with that force field. And then the parameter are read in the force field file. Then we have, we will have a section for the pay, a directive for the pairs, a directive for the angles, so where we define all the angles, and the directive for the theta. So in this ITP file, we define exactly what, uh, what is, uh, what we call molecule type protein Chena, what corresponds to this name. And this name is the one that we have found here in, in our system. So we know that we have to use this information to describe the first atoms that are found in the coordinate file or structure file. The structure coordinate, the structure file can be a growth file, can also be a PDB file that is not important format. We all accept them, maybe other format file. So we say, in the topology, we have information of all the atoms that are in the order, which are you can find, how they are bond, the angle, the dihedral. And then we have also another information. We have also, we are also, if we call also inside the topology a file. We include also a file that is the position restraint file. This file contains the information if we want to run with position restraint, we activate, we tell this software to use the information on this file. If we run without position restraint, we, this file is not used, but it's still include. And it's important that it's include. So after the description, we have to include the file. It cannot be included in another position. The position should be the one inside the topol.itp. How it looks, the position restraint file, it looks like this. We have atom number. And then we say that we apply a force of 1000 of each x, y, and z of this atom number one. 
you see that for chain one, it starts from one because actually is, is but it's so for this reason needs to be included in the topol protein chain one. So the order in which are given is very important. Okay, so now we want to go further. And so what we found, we found also, if we found also that we include, as I told before, the ion param the, the, the direction to the ion parameter, but in particular, then at the end of this topology, as I told before, we have defined this, the molecule and the order in which you have to read. So this order is very important and it should be exactly the same order that you have in the structure of five. If you will have water, we will see, we will add, a line will be added here. If we have ion, a line will be added. And we know that the link to the ion and to the water model are already inside the topology, are called and include already. Okay, now we have our nice system and we want to build a box in this system. So before this, I just ask Joe if there are any questions. There was one question um, about protonation, uh, which I answered. Could you, could you just tell so everybody know it? Sure, yeah. So the, the question was, uh, suppose I have a protein structure obtained from NMR uh, already with the correct protonation. Is there any way to tell PDB to GMX to keep the H atoms as they are? And so I said, you can, um, but only if every proton is present. Um, and in practice, the protons are actually not that important uh, for your simulation. And so they came back and said, uh, what about histidine? And so the answer there is that uh, there's actually a command line flag for PDB to GMX that lets you choose which histidine type you want interactively. Okay. Uh, it will be good if people after that they make a question, if the answer was okay, they just say, okay, thank you. So we know that they understood the answer. Yeah. They, they, they did, in fact. Okay, so okay, great, that, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I don't have call a check. I don't check the, the, the chat. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I will go on. Uh, so we have our... Oh, actually, we've got uh, an, another question, which, uh, which I'll answer and then also uh, type. Um, so the question is that how do we define position restraints? Um, so basically, there's a tool for defining uh, position restraints. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but uh, essentially, all you need is uh, a list of indexes that you want to have the position restraints on. So you can uh, generate this list using GMX select, um, which has a very nice uh, regular expression uh, syntax for selecting in different parts of your system. Um, and then, yeah, for the magnitude, uh, you can probably just use the defaults um, value, should be fine. Okay, thank you. So now we have our molecule, we have a topology describing it, the coordinate of our protein. Now we want to put in a, in a box, we choose, a, a, this is pretty global protein. So we choose the decahedron box with, the opium, with this option. We, use, we want also that the center is uh, uh, at least one nanometer from the edge, from both sides. That is also what uh, we want. And this is also, like we say, it's important the dimension of the box is large enough to avoid that one molecule C is imaging, one atom C is imaging, also the molecule itself. And then we can uh, just run and it will build the new, the new box. So it tell us uh, which was the old box and it will build the new box. If in the file you had for velocity information, these are just Put in this case, we have no velocity information since it was coming from a PDB file, the original file. So now we have this new file where the, we have defined the box. And uh, this is uh, the center, the position, this is around the volume of the box. Now we would like to have water because we want to simulate this protein in water solution. 
There is another tool called Sogenic Solvate that allowed us to solvate the, any macromolecule. And we need with our option main and solvent box. If we are using water, we want we have to provide a water already relaxed box of water molecule. If you want to, for example, solvate in octanol, you need to provide a already relaxed octanol water, the uh, water, not sorry, octanol box. So we also provide a link, uh, information of the topology. Why we do that? Because when we solvate, we add, we fill up the box with water and you want to know how many water and we want that these are automatically added to the topology. So we have already, we have it already in the description of our system. So we run it. And then we see, we run it. Uh, we just have a small note on the van der Waals and we get uh, the number of water molecules that have been added. And uh, now we go to see at the tail of the topol dot top, where we have, we know that in our structural file, first we have chain A, then we have chain L, and then we have 11,000, around 11,000 solvent molecules, okay? And that is the order also that we will have in the structural file. Now, we would like to run on the correct ion concentration. So we need to add ion. Also because we have our protein is minus one charge, we say it's minus two, sorry, the charge of the old protein. And so we want to neutralize the protein, but also we want to run in a good, uh, ion condition and we will choose in this case a standard physiological condition that will be something like 0 0.15 molar on NACL. So this is a little more complicated how to add the ion. So we have uh, uh, so we have first uh, to create an empty with this command we just create an MD, empty MDP file parameter file. So we run it and now we run GROMPP. GROMPP is a pro-processing tool that uh, put together the information that I was telling you before. We have three input file in GROMAX, the MDP file, the, that is the parameter that what we want to run. So how we want to run. Then we have a structural file that is given with the option main C. Then a main P provide information on the topology. And MENF will provide the information on what we want to run, what, how we want to run. So in this case, this file is empty, but we need the, the generation of this TPR file. This file contains both the information of the position of the atom and on the parameter of the functional form. So we run this to create this file, to put everything together. So here we will get a lot of warning since a note in particular, you can see we get a list of note because our MTP file is empty. So then if you have another MTP file not empty, you can run it, you can use it. Then this TPR file that we have generated is the only use of this is to give as an input to GenION because here we have both information on the potential of the atom and the position of the atoms. And that is what the gen, gen ion uh, need to put the ion in the, in the correct where in the correct position inside the growth file. So here we run what exactly we ask gen ion, we ask to, to add ion and which ion we want a positive ion called Na and a, positive, a negative ion called CL. And then the, as default, the charge of the pos positive ion is plus one and the negative ion is minus one, but you can change. We want that the total charge of the system is neutral. For this reason, we need a file where it contains information also on, on the Coulomb potential, so on the charge of the atoms. And we also, want that is write all the information of the ion that gets out in the topology file and is write a new structural file where also the ion are added. 
And where to put the ion is the last information that we need to tell him. We have to decide where to put the ion. We will, you will see we have a list of different group that we can choose and we will choose the solvent group. So we run it, oh sorry, we run it. So we see what happens. So here are the list of all the edible group and we decide that we have to put, we add the ion in the solvent group, that what means that a, so a randomly chosen water molecule will be replaced by ion. So we, need, we, will, we will put, uh, in this case, we add at the beginning. So here you see, we replace a water molecule with this ion. This water molecule is replaced with this ion and going on. Okay. And at the end, to get the condition that we want, we need to add around 38 sodium ion and 36 chloro ion. So, and this, so if we go to see if this is really the case, we go to see the tail of our topology file that has to be updated. And then indeed we see the same value and you see also this order is very important. Uh, first, we have always chain A, then chain L, then the solvent, and then we, add, we have add information of ion and chlor. If now you go to see also the grow file, you will see the same order. You will see all the position of the atoms, but in this order. So the ion will be the last. Okay, now we are, our system is complete. It's, uh, we have a topology describe everything. We have a structural file describe everything. Now we need to start. So the structure is coming from an experimental structure. So maybe go through a refinement procedure using a different potential. So, and maybe also the position of the ion and the solvent are not optimal now. We might have some clash. So the first things that we need is to energy minimize the structure. Here we provide an example of energy of NDP file for energy minimization, where we define the parameter for the energy minimization. We say we, what we use, we will use steep descendant and, uh, as algorithm. And then uh, we will say information when we think the system is converged. And so the energy minimization got convergency. And also we define some other setting. And these are a more force field related settings. So we define which constraint we have to use. In this case, we run charm, we use constraints on the bonds, all the atoms involving hydrogen are constrained. Then we have uh, the Coulomb and Van der Waals setting for the long range interaction defined according to the charm setting. And uh, so then we run Grand PP where in the, we process all the information inside of this TPR file where you see we use this parameter file. So we say that we want to do run energy minimization under this condition. We want uh, to use uh, this structural file and then the corresponding topology file. So we run this. Then we see what is putting out. It's always good to have a check if you see, if you see some warnings, some notes, something that is not working. It seems that everything is is going good. One other good information that is provided is how much data is generated. Sometimes not for energy minimization, but maybe for molecular simulation, if you long, run very long simulation, you might generate too many data. And that's so you have to have the space to have for those data. So, or maybe you have to change some setting to generate less data, okay? Now we run this. And we use MD run to run this, giving us this TPR file as an input. And we will, with this option, we say that we all our output, that we know that we have different type of output from file, I will call EM. So we run it. And then here is ask main V verbos. So we will see all step that is running. This will take a while. And it will produce a file called a grow file, that is the last configuration file. 
it will create a log file that is an ASCII file of the uh, energy minimization disk contest process. And then we'll create a an energy file with all the energy of storage and also a trajectory file that in this case is not really a trajectory since it's an energy minimization. Okay, so while it's running here, I just ask Joe if there are any questions that he wants to address. Yeah, there's uh, been a number of uh, questions. Let's see. Um, so someone asked, is force field parameter conversion to uh, Gromax accurate, say I prepared the system in Amber and converted my topology with Parmed? Uh, how different would the parameters be relative to the one from Amber ports in Gromax? So it should be fine. Uh, many people use such tools, so there's you know some kind of trust that uh, at, at least if it is wrong, you will be wrong in the same way as everyone else. Um, so uh, and okay, I, I've used such I, I've used such tools. You know they they generally work. Um, you know, but it is always uh, incumbent upon researchers to validate uh, that the parameters are are reasonable. I would say. Joe, is speaking about parameters or parameter file? So the uh, MD, MDP param parameter file? No, no. So this is just about okay. the topology generation. Yeah. Okay, okay. But but there's also a question on where to get the MDP files. Um, so uh, this is <laughs> this is the art, uh, I, I would say, of, of the technique. So you have to generate these yourself. You know, we do our best to pick uh, some sensible defaults for the MDP options but you need to use different parameters for different types of simulations, e.g. if you're doing a minimization or equilibration, if you're doing AWH or you know, using some other advanced methodologies, you'll have different, uh, uh, different flags that you need to set as yes or no, or you know, some, some value. Um, but uh, once you have uh, an MVP file for a specific type of simulation, you know, let's say you have an MVP file that, that you believe is useful for uh, doing an equilibration of a membrane protein. If you have another similar kind of membrane protein, it, it should also be useful for, for doing an equilibration there. But if you have a very different kind of system, uh, then you, know, you still might need to change your MDP files. So uh, it's, a, it's an area that, uh, yeah, you just kind of have to uh, ask, ask around. You know, generally, you, you have some colleagues uh, hopefully, who, who have done such things that, that you can answer, uh, ask questions to. Um. Yeah, and uh, uh, you can ask on uh, on the forum if you want. Indeed, yes. Yeah, and there is also a webinar on uh, the MTP parameter, on the BioXL webinar. But there is the link, I think, inside the tutorial. And with the tutorial, the last things that I want to say, we provide also, I think, in this directory, as all MDP files that we have built uh, for both Amber and Charm that can be used. So you can find in, uh, in the tutorial, in the tutorial, yeah. Okay. Oh, and there was one other question, which is, is it possible to differentiate between a ligand and other heteroatoms in a PDB file? And so I guessed it appears correctly that the question was actually about how do you get rid of heteroatoms or select um, only a specific uh, subset of your system. And so for that, the answer is again, GMX select, um, which you can you know, use to uh, select arbitrary parts of your system. You, know, you might need to actually go in to the PDB file and look at what the residue names are, um, possibly using some viewer such as NGL viewer or PyMol or VMV. Um, in order to make the correct selection, but you know, in principle, there's a number of ways. So you don't have, you don't have to use GMX select. You can, you know, use regular expression. You can. Uh, there's there's other there's there's many tools basically for for manipulating PDB files. I would say uh, the PDB format is capacious, so none of the PDB manipulation tools are probably going to have every feature that you might want because. PDB files can contain such a wide variety of information, but in general, uh, it's not so hard to figure out, uh, you know, which part of your system you want. Yeah. So I just I just show in uh, in uh, in the tutorial 
the the help of a GMX Select, that is the tools that Joe was speaking about. When you have a tool, you can use an option manage, you see the help, and then it will point you all the what is can do. Yeah. But just that you can yes, and actually in the case of GMX Select, uh, you can also go to the Gromax website, which has uh, or maybe in the manual, um, which has a number of basically examples of selections that are extremely useful for getting a handle on how to use it. Yeah, there is a page a page under the manual on the user guides. Yeah. where you have all the syntax. You can also, if you go, there is a lot of question on that and answer in the forum. If you Google in the forum, I think you find it very easy. Okay, thank you very much. We can just go on. So we have our system energy minimized now. And maybe we want to check if it's really energy minimized. So GMX Energy is one of the tools, the Gromax tools that help to analyze the energy file. So main F is how we provide input usually in the energy, in the Gromax tool. Main O is the output. And here we ask that the automatic Gromax tool produce an output that is a plot that can be edited, uh, visualized, sorry, or plotted with XM Grace. Here we use option none because we want to use Panda, just for an example. So we run it. Is running. We is provide the average, but for an, for an energy minimization, we are not really interested in the average. We want to see what happens to the potential energy in this case, and then we see that the energy is going down. So that is what we want to check. This is not time actually. This is a step, simulation step, uh, energy minimization step, and uh, we can uh, easy. Uh, so we can easily see that it's going down. So we assume we are fine. We are happy with our energy minimization and we can go on. Now we would like to take the system to the correct temperature. So we and to relax the solvent and the ion because we the, the solvent we just the ion we just put in a random position in place of water molecules. So we want to relax all the environment around the protein and to reach the correct temperature. So in this case, we will use position restraint. So we keep constrain the position. For example, in this point, we keep the position of the atom of the, problem, of the protein fixed. And how we do it, we do with the MTP file, we define the post ref. So we activate the position restraint of the protein. Then we have, we will see here some, now we want to run with, to keep the system to the correct temperature, but we still keep the volume constant. So we will see how it looks like our MVT, an MVP parameter file. We activate the position restraint. We will use in this case now MD, leapfrog integrator is used. We say which time step we want. A time step is, in uh, picoseconds, we say the number of steps that we want to run, and we want we say which is the frequency that we want to save. Uh, more on this, I will say. We later we use we define that we use boundary condition now, and we here we give the information about the thermostat that we are using. We use V scale. We don't use pressure coupling because we run a constant volume. We generate a starting velocity at the temperature that we want to run, that is 300 Kelvin. And here, this setting is exactly the one before because it's the one linked to the force field. And it involves the long range interelectrostatic and the constraint. So now, as before, we have to use this MDP file together with the output that now is input of the energy minimization, we have to provide information, a, a structural file for the reference for the position restraint. In our case, it's exactly the same. And uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have to provide the topology file, and then we generate TPR file that then is processed by MD run. 
So we will run it. We have just want to go through. Yeah, we run it. We will get a note that we have to pay attention because we use position restraint. Uh, removing the center of mass in the presence of position restraint might cause artifacts, but these are negligible if we are doing an equilibration that is what we are currently doing it so we can we are fine we know what we are doing so we proceed and then here is running the simulation the simulation as you can see it will take a while to finish so we can just stop it you can go to kernel interrupt and then you can go here and you remove dash and then you can copy, these are the already the output. So we there is an energy file and growth file and, and checkpoint file that we will use for starting the next step. So we run this. And now we want to have a feeling what happens to the temperature. So we use GMX energy to extract information on the temperature. And here it provides us the average temperature that is pretty close to the reference that is 300. So it's almost 300, it's 300, this one. And we look how it looks like. We see that the temperature is not always 300, but it's fluctuate around the 300, like we were expecting. And since we use uh, this scale, the fluctuation for this is a very short simulation or for a longer simulation should be, is also correct. Then we have, so our system got the correct, is relax the solvent around the protein. And the, now that we reach the temperature, now we want to also to go on and to reach the correct pressure to so in a way that then after that we can run the data production. So in this case, we have to change our MDP file to adults information on the pressure. So here we see we we still have a position, we add, uh, these are all identical, the first part, uh, and then here we add information of the bar stop. The semicolon is just uh, a comment. After the semicolon, you can put a comment, just that you know. Uh, okay, so we, we will use C scale as a bar stop, and we want it in an isotropic way, our reference tau, Temperature is uh, my, our reference pressure. Sorry, it's one. We we are in water, so we use water compressibility. And uh, the, the temperature setting is identical. We add here continuation since we want to start exactly from the condition that of the last run. So we say continuation, and these are the setting. A first field setting that are exactly the first setting that depends on the first field that are exactly the same of the previous MDP file. And if you notice, we are not generating velocity now because we already have the velocity information from the previous run. So now we give as an input for to Grom PP this new MDP file, we give the MVT, the last configuration file of the canonical simulation and uh, and then again we give this as a reference for the position restraint then we want that to keep the information exactly is a continuous run so we get the last checkpoint of the previous simulation topology and then we run that we run ground pp we don't have uh, we have the same note of before because we are still and we are still in equilibration is fine and then we are done then here we can run i will skip this because we don't have time to run but you can run it and then we just copy we provide the output so we can just copy the output here and you see again this is as output we have energy file and grow file and then checkpoint file we want to see what happens to the pressure. So with G energy, we can extract pressure information. And we see that the pressure actually is not really one, but we have a very large standard deviation. So 
it's almost so it's so large that it's indistinguishable from the real value. So we have to expect always, like before I say, very large root mean square deviation for the pressure. And this you see that is oscillate around 10, around 10, around 10. It's also that 100 picosecond that we use here for because we it's very short equilibration time for this system might need a little longer equilibration time to get a better value of the pressure. We can see what happens also to the density, for example, if we get a reasonable density. So it means that since we have a protein in water, we would like to have a density closer to the water density without hole, for example. So we calculate in this way, we can ask to calculate the density. So here you see, when I give the command, usually G energy, I always ask for one of the option here. You can do interactively, but you can also ask here, you put HO and the name of the property this density, correspond number 25. There are two ways to provide this as input. The average value is around 1020. 22, we know that uh, the spectral water density is around 1000, so we are, we are pretty close, so we assume that our system is in a reasonable relaxed condition. So then we move, we can move on for uh, the, We already copy, yeah, sorry, I was just, we can move on to the data production. So now we see this is, so we have a relaxed system on the good temperature, good pressure, we can see. And here is, a, we remove position restraint now. We have our simulations, uh, we want, we will run 100 picoseconds, which is very short, but one can change this and run longer if you want. These are all the settings that we have. Uh, something more information that we add here is also because it's more important in the data production that you control the frequency of your output. Here you can save how frequent you want to save the coordinate, the velocity, the force in the TRR file, for example, how frequency you want to save in the log file or in the energy file or in uh, the XTC file. Why we have this option? Because otherwise you can generate, you might end up to generate too large file that, that there is no space and maybe not all the information of each step of two femtoseconds are necessary for your analysis. Maybe it's enough to have information every 200 picoseconds, for example, depends on the question and the property that you want to calculate. So this is an important uh, control. So now we run again from PP to put all our parameter again together. And now we will see that we don't have any more the node since we don't have any more position restraint. We don't generate so much data, but you mentioned we are also running very short simulation here. Uh, and when we can end here with this comment, we can run the simulation. Now for sake of time, I will not run. I just copy the output because I want to show you some analysis, some optional analysis. So we run this. So you can see as output, we obtain a log file, an energy file, a growth file. That is the last coordinate of all the atom and a trajectory file. And uh, here in this trajectory file, as you can see here, we have decided to save every 2,500 2, step. So not every step. Okay. So this trajectory during the simulation, we are running with periodic boundary condition. Uh, your uh, molecule might move around in the box and it might occur that uh, it go out of the box uh, and it come in from the other side. Like I was telling you, one atom go out and come in in the other one. So if you visualize directly, this trajectory might be is not very nice to look or it might look to you that uh, the molecule is broken. Uh, there are some artifacts. So you can use this uh, Pro processing tool called GMX Conf to 
in this case to make the molecule whole and to recenter your molecule. And then you have to provide always MNF. MNF, as I told before, you provide the input, but this you have also to provide frequently with option MNF information on the topology of the file that are inside the TPR file. So we run. And uh, so we select here one and one, what means that with the first selection one, so this group, we want to center on the protein. And then with the second group that we have selected, we want also as output only the protein. So we don't want in the output information on the solvent or on the ion. We want to ask also with this special also on the protein. So these are a group, a standard group that are already inbuilt inside. But you can also have, as Joe was saying before, different type of groups. So then uh, you have to generate a file, an index file, where those groups are defined, and you might give this as an input main, option main N. Okay. And now we want to see how it looks like now, our trajectory. Here we can visualize it. Yeah, it take a little while. I use the models MD Traject and NGL View to visualize this, and then we can play it. We can see these are our short, it's one, 100 picoseconds, so it's very short simulation, but we see that is the protein is whole, is center, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, fluctuating the position of the atom. Okay. Other things that is very important, so one thing is to visualize, to look your trajectory. The other thing that is very important to do is to check that you don't arte have artifact in the sense that your molecule may be opening and then uh, your box result to be too small. So it's always good to check what is the minimum distance between your protein, in this case because I speak about protein, the protein and is all is imaging. And that you can calculate using the common GMX mean dist. Again, you give the TPR file as an input and the trajectory file. You ask to when this option to calculate the distance with the image. And then you run main dist. Uh, then it will write the output in the file main dist. Okay, so we will see what is the minimum distance that we found. And it tells us, uh, it's calculating, it will provide us uh, also as a standard output, the minimum distance and this distance should be larger the cutoff. Otherwise, we have some problems. We have uh, two nanometer as at 80, so th the protein can closer to its image at 80 picoseconds. And that distance is two nanometers, so it's the minimum distance that is found. And this is larger than the cutoff that was 1.2. So we, it's a, it's a good. Okay. Then we, there are other tools that can allow us to. Here I put other tools that you can use to analyze. Here root mean square deviation. I will not go in details. You can find here other tools that you can use. You, Example of other tools, uh, radio duration, how to generate an index file. And uh, you always, when you have a Gromax tool, manage, you will have the help, or you can look for the help in uh, the manual. And now I will give the word to Joe that uh, for the last par minutes, maybe he has some question that he wants to address. Yes, yeah, so we got another question about restraints. So the question was about using restraints to force the in terminal of a protein to remain embedded in a membrane. Um, and also said, uh, you know, wondered whether maybe flat bottom restraints uh, might be a better choice than harmonic restraints. And so the answer, I would say, uh, depends on what property of the system you're interested in. You know, of course, you can use uh, position restraints to keep uh, your protein embedded in a membrane or to keep any two uh, molecules close, close to each other. Um, 
so the flat bottom restraints will only add force uh, if they get far enough apart, whereas a harmonic restraint will add force whenever uh, you know the, the two things are not at their equilibrium distance. Um, but in either case, you can't really use the results of a production simulation uh, with position restraints without further work, because the energy is not going to be conserved. And so if you're adding energy to your system, you're going to have to do some uh, statistics to basically create the distribution to remove the bias you've added. I would say that this is uh, an advanced topic and perhaps not recommended, uh, you know, unless you have some experience running simulations already and also uh, a firm grounding in the statistical mechanics and the methods necessary um, to, to get this to work. So, uh, and in any case, uh, just, just adding position restraints probably wouldn't be what you would want to do. Um, you would probably use some other uh, enhanced sampling technique to, to try to force your, your system to remain in the configuration that you're interested in, um, in, in some way that is easier to actually keep track of the energy you're adding to the system. Um, or, you know, there are a number of ways to do this, but, uh, you know, if you just want to run a simulation to see something wiggling around, uh, you know, it's fine. But if you actually want to learn about the properties of your system, I'd say you can't really use position restraints. If there are not other, are there other questions? I'm not seeing any. Okay, if not, I can go through the analysis since we still have some, some time. I think, uh, yeah. It's okay? Yeah. Okay, so I was telling you, so we have seen here, we have checked that the, the molecule look reasonable. We have checked uh, that uh, the, it doesn't have artifacts, so it doesn't see. Is is uh, not too short distance with this imaging. Then, uh, for example, one of the things that people might look for protein is uh, the uh, root square deviation respect to the original structure. And uh, for example, here, so you can see usually we give as a TPR file, the production run TPR file, then the TPR file. But in this case, we give the, the, the energy minimization TPR file. While this, if you remember how it was built, this file, this file was built having the information. We can go up to see which information we're in this file when we run Grom PP. Yeah, so here we put, okay, information on how, what, how we want to run the energy minimization. But as a structural file, we put this file that is exactly the file that comes from the PDP structure. It was solvate and uh, ion were added. So in this structure, this structure contains exactly the experimental structure like it is. Maybe ion has been added. But for the rest, the other position of all the other heteroatoms is that the one that were in the original structure. And then we put the topology file. And, we, and this information on this structure are in the em.tpr file. And now this is the reason now when we do the analysis. When we have the analysis here, we can have, uh, so not here, here. We, we want to have the root mean square compare our trajectory with the original structure that was in the experimental structure. But so here we have information on the original structure, a, a processing of the, this is a information of the process structure from where the position of this atom are exactly the same that are origin in the PDB file. Then we have our trajectory here, and then here will provide us uh, the root mean square division with respect to the X-ray. We can also decide how to, if we want to write the information in nanoseconds or in picoseconds with this option. We can run now.
and we can visualize here the file that we obtain. Okay, so we can see that the, at the big we have a, we have a root mean square deviation that is uh, increasing, and then slowly is getting to a plateau. That is what we normally expect, starting from experimental structure, that we have a slightly deviation from the experimental structure. And then at one point, we get a stability of the system, a convergence of the system. Also, the other option here that was used was uh, four and one. Here is always a way to select the group. And in this case, we ask the first selection is the group for the least, least, least square feet. And this case is the backbone. And then we want to have a group for the root mean square deviation. And in this case, this group is one, so it's the protein. Okay, so we fit on the backbone and we calculate the root mean square deviation for the whole protein. You can have different approach here, just to explain what exactly do this command. Like I was saying, if you want to have the help of any tools, you can run the option man H, you can run and then you can see. It, give, it provides you the description of the tools, if there are some reference, and then all different, describe all the different options, and then it describe which file it needs to be as input, which are the output file, and then here it describe all different options that you can use. Other things that one one want to see maybe to understand if the protein keep its globality or is folding apart is maybe at the radius of G-gration. So this is the tools GMX G-rate, which H01 we call that we want to apply to the group one that was we know the protein from before. Again, we give the file. The trajectory file, in this case, we give the TPR file of the production run. So we run and we can see what it looks like. And then here, also in this case, we'll reach. So it's a span a little, but very small, as you can see from the number here. And you get also to a sort of plateau. Of of course, the molecule is always oscillating everything. We never get one value in simulation. We always get an average. Other tools that is very useful is uh, together with JMIX Select that was mentioned before is Make Index. That is was the, somehow uh, an older tool than JMIX Select. And uh, so this might allow you to create an index file with the selection that you want. For example, in this case, I ask that I want to create an index file from this, the information that are in this TPR file. So this, this TPR file, they are the position of the atom and the topology of the atom. And I want in particular to split the chain. Chain one, I want, I want sorry, I want to split the group one in chain. And now we go to see. So it's calling. So these are the group that you already has. The command that I ask, I ask to use this, this one, split chain, so to split in chain the group. And which group I want, I want to split protein in the two chain, because I know that there are two chains in the protein. So if I give this command, split CH, and then I, put, I give the number one, like I did here. Then I get that I have two chains, two new chains are added. And these two new group will be added here at the end. So we will have an index file where we have two group at the end. Why I wanted this, I create this two chain. For example, I would like to calculate the hydrogen bond between these two chain. So now I have two ester group here. So it will be number 19 and number 20. Don't know if we can maybe, if I do like this, I can show it probably. 
main n, and then uh, we will remove this one because we don't need it anymore. Alessandra, you can also add the minus quiet flag so you don't get the header and you directly. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's minus quiet. Yes. Run. Oh, okay. So now we see that these are the group that are defined in our, in our main end, that is our index, which is file is called NDX. And then you can see that we have two extra group added, one contain information on the atom that are in chain one and the other is the atom are in chain two. So these group are called 19 and 20. So now I just want to go out. So I don't know. Yeah, this is I interrupt because yeah. Uh, then we go further, and here so we want to run the to understand which hydrogen bond are between this uh, like say these two chain. So GMXH bond will provide us. We provide again the trajectory file, the NTP file, and now we provide the index file. The option num it will tell us how many hydrogen bonds there are. We run it. Ah, I think my I don't manage to interrupt these shells, sorry. Okay. Uh, now we stuck everything, but I can. Do you know, Joe, if I can just kill the latest cell and it will go further or he doesn't like it? I think my kernel got stuck. Yeah, I think it, I think if you interrupt it should be fine. I can try to remove the output maybe, yeah. Yeah, okay. S sorry, my... Okay, so then we can run this one. And now we see if it's running or if I mess up uh, my kernel. Okay, the command it looks that it doesn't want to run, but it will generate the hydrogen bond with the two, one, yeah. And uh, So I stop, I clear this output. And here you can visualize with this, the hydrogen bond that you have. And then that was the last things that I want to address. Okay. If uh, I think my, I can try to run a gate, but I think my Jupyter notebook gets somehow stuck. Yeah. Okay, we will see. But in your case, you should run without problem. Yeah. Okay, so there are any other questions? So uh, there, was, there was actually a follow-up on uh, the restraints question. So they said uh, that they don't want to over-restrain the position, but just to make sure that it stays uh, close um, and uh, the, the answer uh, I would say is that uh, if you, for instance, uh, in, in this case, the person I was talking about uh, trying to embed an interminal domain of a protein in a membrane, if you have this setup and you run it multiple times and the protein is always coming, coming out of the system very quickly, uh, and you have some kind of experimental data that leads you to believe that this should not happen, um, then you need to go back to that experimental data and uh, try to understand the biology and figure out which components of the system are actually missing um, to, such that you get the behavior that you're expecting. 
I mean, you can't, uh, if you're interested in understanding the physics of your system, you can't just like make up new, new physics to get around the, the fact that your system is not behaving in the, in the way you expect, basically. Um, and so then there's another question um, about uh, using, uh, basically running in D and then making clusters uh, to use uh, as representative structures for uh, docking, for, for uh, ligand docking. And uh, yeah, so this is, this is a challenging topic. Um, so I would say, first of all, you, know, you can't really use RMSD um, because RMSD doesn't define a metric. So uh, what that means is that uh, if you have the relation, the RMSD relationship of structure A to B and the RMSD relationship of structure A to C, this doesn't tell you anything about the RMSD relationship of structure B to C. It doesn't, it doesn't define an ordering, basically. Um, and so uh, if you want to actually have the representative structures, you need to have structures that are representative relative to some actual metric. Um, so there's an entire field of molecular simulation um, that's uh, devoted basically to picking collective variables. And so you would need, you would generally want to do your, your clustering relative to some collective variables that are relevant to the binding event uh, that, you, that you're hoping to understand. Yeah, I may ask, uh, just more simple, this is very advanced, more simple yeah. one can just try to screen uh, using just uh, the cluster approach that are used in GMX uh, cluster, yeah. just to have a feeling at least if, if you have something, and then you can choose uh, what uh, a cluster algorithm. And then what uh, Joe will say is something that you will achieve when you have a long enough simulation that depends a lot, uh, which is the contest, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, for a collective variable, you need long, longer simulation. Yeah. But in but in general, if you just like if your plan is to run a hundred nanosecond simulation and like you know take frames every ten nanoseconds uh, and then perform docking, I would say that this is probably not a very useful uh, use of computational resources. You, you're probably uh, just as well, you know, running. Uh, you're, you're docking on the initial structure, basically? Uh, what we have seen uh, doing docking between uh, antigen and antibody is that it's actually helpful to relax, to, to relax uh, the conformation of one of the two proteins and then to extract from them the, the conformation using GMX cluster and then plug in that in the docking procedure. Yeah. So that is uh, what we have done, but that's because with docking, usually you choose something very fast so that it doesn't too much time consuming. So yeah, exactly. But this is, was a specific, uh, a specific uh, use case that we have addressed in by Excel. What you're speaking is more a scientific, uh, a scientific question, I think. Yeah, Indeed. yeah, that, that 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 was mostly my point is that uh, you you know you won't get way better results uh, if you do a short simulation, um, and if you're if you're just hoping to to get some initial data to you know do more longer simulations, uh, you know, you don't need to spend much time on on generating uh, different uh, basically different. Uh, Confirmations because the confirmations that you will get in you know 100 nanoseconds will be pretty highly correlated. But, yeah. but uh, in general, if 